After the ETS and SBL conferences were over, Wendy and I went to uh, my mother's home, uh, a little bit, about 100 miles northwest of San Diego, and we spent uh, time with her to celebrate American Thanksgiving. And we were, it was interesting to be back at the home where my parents had moved in when I was four years old, and uh, so my mother has lived in that home now for over 50 years. So we had one of my sisters there, and uh, Wendy and I were there, and my mother was there. And of course, being in that environment reminds you of your family, your family of origin, and all of the things that go along with one's family of origin, good and bad. Some of you perhaps came from functional families. Those of you who are being honest will admit you came from dysfunctional families. And most of us came from families that at least were interesting at uh, most times, if not all times. We all have them. We can't get away from them. And we are part of them in one way or another. Even if not our family of origin, the family that we are now creating with our spouse and with possibly children. My sister was telling me about a, an important book that has appeared recently uh, that's tied in with families. It's a book called Attachments. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this book. But this book has the theory that uh, the attachments that you formed with your parents in your early years have a huge influence on the kinds of relationships that you have throughout the rest of your life. If you had a secure attachments or uh, anxious attachments or several other kinds, these attachments are very, very uh, important to the kinds of relationships that you form and how you enter into these relationships through the rest of your life. So some of you are wondering, why am I talking about this on the uh, beginning of Advent when I'm supposed to be talking about a particular parable? Well, I think this will all come together uh, in a moment, but I want to read the parable that I'm going to uh, be talking about today. And again, you might think it's a little bit unusual to have selected for our last service, as we begin Advent, head towards Christmas, uh, a parable, which a parable that I am calling the parable of the three sons. The parable of the three sons. When I mentioned this to Wendy, she thought immediately of the television program, uh, but uh, perhaps it'll be a little more significant than, than that old television program. Three of you are nodding your heads, which means three of you are as old as I am. But uh, this is about the parable, I'm calling it, of the three sons, found in Luke 15. Continuing on from the couple of parables that I talked about last time that I was together. So let me read this, uh, sh this parable to you. We notice at the beginning of chapter 15 of Luke, Jesus is with tax collectors and sinners, and then the Pharisees, teachers of the law, they mutter, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And so Jesus decides to tell them a couple of parables. And then he gets to a third parable. Jesus said this, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the paws that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, 
Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, All these years, I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead And is alive again. He was lost and is found. Now, last time I talked a little bit about a parable, I recounted for you a little bit about some of the history of parable interpretation. Some of you perhaps will remember that or have remembered it from some other time when you you studied parables. Originally, people thought of parables as uh, some kind of allegory. You know, this is a well-known view. Parable interpretation is a fascinating thing. So some started with allegory. Another finally came along and thought that parables are really uh, reduced down to one simple kind of point that they're trying to make. Perhaps they are stories about the kingdom. That's been a very important idea. Sometimes they're stories about rural life or lessons for life drawn from Palestinian Uh, life itself that Jesus was involved in. Others think of them as fairly complex literary kinds of statements. And others have revived again the idea of the allegory, which that's about 16, 1700 years of parable research in about 30 seconds, which tells you that at the end of the day, parables are very complex. Parables told by Jesus, in fact, are very complex and not easily reducible to anything. Uh, that says, you know, this is just simply the way a parable works. And I don't want to try to do that either. But one of the things that I think is a neglected feature of parables, when we look at parables, is that the teller of the story itself, Jesus, is in one sense a part of every parable that he tells. So we tend to want to take the parables and isolate them from the teller, Jesus, and just concentrate on what we see as the parable, when in fact we need to realize that part of the story is in fact the teller of the story, that Jesus himself intervenes and intrudes in his parables. For example, we were talking a few weeks earlier about the parable of the Good Samaritan. Good Samaritan is a great example of this, a very obvious example. Jesus tells the story of this Samaritan who rescues the person who was beaten going on the road to Jericho. But the story is not complete, is it? Until Jesus asks the inquirer, this lawyer, he says, which one was a good neighbor? And that helps us to understand exactly what that parable is about. And the lawyer answers back, and Jesus tells him that that's what he should do. Now, this parable that I've just read, the parable of the three sons, is a little bit different from the parable of the Good Samaritan and some other parables. It's a very familiar parable. In some ways, it's probably a bit of a silly thing for me to try to say much new about this parable, the parable of the three sons, because we are so familiar with this parable. We're familiar, for example, with the younger son, aren't we? The prodigal son, the so-called prodigal son. We don't know the history of it, but here he was, a part of this family. We have the father, we have the older son, we have the younger son. Perhaps he's 
typically responding as a younger child. We don't know, but he comes to his father one day and he says that he wants his inheritance. The father hears this. We don't see the father's response. He does grant the request. He hears him. He divides his inheritance. The son takes this inheritance and he goes off to live the high life. He goes off, and as long as he has money, things are going fantastically. Well, he blows through that family fortune, and then things turn bad. You notice they don't mention all of his friends who come to his rescue. In fact, he doesn't have any friends who come to his rescue. He is out of money, he's out of friends, he's out of everything. So what does he do? Well, he ends up feeding pigs as a hired servant with barely enough to live. No doubt part of the impact of this parable is that we're to understand perhaps that this is a Jewish family and that this is a Jewish boy and here he is doing what? He's tending the unclean animals. But at one point he comes to his senses. It says in the, the Greek text he comes to himself. Right? It's like he suddenly, something comes to his mind that he realizes that he hadn't seen before. He knows that his father's servants, they have more to eat than he does. He has less now than his father's servants do. So he decides to return. Duly chastened. Duly humbled. In fact, he plans in advance what he's going to say to his father. He is going to throw himself on the mercy of his father and realize, I am willing to be your servant because I'll at least do better than I'm doing now. So we know the prodigal son. We know that story. We also know the story of the older son, don't we? He sees the festivities that are going on and he makes an inquiry about what's going on. All this music and dancing that's going on. I didn't realize that we were having a party this weekend finds out his brother's return, there's a lot of celebrating, and instead of rejoicing, he's upset. He's mad. He's angry. He's always done the right thing. He's always been the obedient son. He didn't take his inheritance and run off. He hasn't spent it in wild living and with prostitutes. He hasn't blown through all of it so that he's sitting there with pigs. No, he's done the, the right thing never squandered the family fortune, but now they're celebrating and having a party for somebody else. The self-righteous older son, right? He's pretty sure he's done everything right. And so because of his being right, he thinks he should command a certain amount of recognition. And then there's the father. The father. Probably, I, I think, one of the, the great characters of the Bible. In fact, possibly one of the, the great characters of ancient literature. For those of us who have read the parable, as I'm sure all of us have, and as I just read it, no matter how much and what you think about the, the two sons, you have a pretty clear idea of who the father is. The father's not described in huge words. Not a lot more is given to the father than anybody else in here. But we all know quite a bit about the father. In fact, probably uh, some of us wish we'd had a father about like this father. Right? I don't know the fathers that you've had. But uh, some of us probably wish we had a father who was as understanding and as forgiving as the father of this parable. You notice that he didn't disagree uh, with his son when he decided to take the fortune. He didn't say no. He heard what his younger son said. He allowed him to make his own decision and to live with the consequences. He's generous. He's forgiving. He constantly waits. Now, we don't know, do we? how long he had been waiting for his son. Perhaps he hadn't been waiting, in fact, very long at all. Perhaps he said, well, you know, he's got so much money. Knowing my son as I do, 
that's probably good for about X amount of time before disaster is going to strike. And so he probably went about his business day in and day out, and then he takes a look at the calendar and realizes, you know, it's probably about now <laughs> that I will hear uh, from my son. And so we notice in the parable that the father is kind of looking down the road one day, thinking, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if I saw somebody heading down the path. In fact, he does. He scans the horizon, no doubt hoping that he's right and hoping that the son has come to his senses and realized that he should come home. And he sees him. But notice what he does. It says that he sees him. He drops everything. And he runs. He runs out towards him. And of course, the father's a pretty wealthy guy. He's got servants. We know that because his son wants to become one. And so, you know, the uh, head of the household's running out there. And you see the little entourage running out after, running, what is this guy doing out there? Notice what happens, though. He comes up to his son. And it says, he comes out to meet him and he falls on his neck. Now, the NIV says that he hugs him. He falls on his neck. Okay, I mean, he just kind of smothers him, right? Totally embraces him. He doesn't stand aloof. You know, you notice he doesn't say, stand off and say, well, I figured you'd be coming home about now. now I knew this would happen. I'd heard reports uh, or whatever, right? And, now, and notice what the son does. The son starts in his little pre-formed speech that he's been practicing, no doubt, every step that he has been taking on this trip back home. He launches into it. Father, uh, you know, you're, you have servants here, and I'd like to be one. Well, the, the father completely ignores it. You notice what he does. He completely ignores it, and he says, you know, grab that great robe, grab the ring, and kill the fatted calf that we have because we've been waiting for an occasion such as this to celebrate my son who has come home. Now, those are the major characters of this parable. And we see in the words, and we can feel the emotion of what is going on in this particular episode. But now you're thinking to yourself, he calls this the parable of the three sons. Where's the third son? in all of this? Well, there is no explicit third son in the story, is there? But keep in mind what we read in verse 2 of chapter 15. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Let me throw out for your consideration that there's no real third son mentioned here. In fact, there's not even some kind of an intrusive voice that comes from uh, outside and intrudes into the parable. This is a parable, however, I think, that shows us several important things. First of all, we see the two sons. And neither is a son really that we want to emulate, right? The one who goes and, and wastes his life. The second, the one who is so self-satisfied and believes that he's done everything right. We're used to thinking then that the father is in fact, maybe he's the commendable figure. In some ways, he's a godlike figure. However, let me suggest that in fact, the father here is really the third son. The father is the Jesus figure of the parable. Just like Jesus was the one who welcomed sinners, it's the father of the parable who welcomes both of his sinful sons. Jesus is telling this parable. The narrative here is framed so that it's Jesus talking to the Pharisees and the others. He's the one who's accused of welcoming those who are sinners. And in fact, that's exactly why Jesus came, wasn't it? To be like the father of the parable. To be the one who, in fact, allows us to make the bad decisions that we make. Who, in fact, 
allows us to, to go our own way, but then who also realizes that there will come a point where we recognize that we have had enough opportunity to get ourselves into sufficiently big trouble that what we need is, in fact, to return home. And so, in fact, Jesus is, I think, this third son, the one who's telling the story, the son who comes to offer forgiveness, the son who comes to, to welcome sinners back home, the one who runs, in fact, out, doesn't stay contentedly at home, but, in fact, runs out in advance to embrace and welcome us as sinners when we turn to him, when we realize that we're at the end of what we can do on our own. We've wasted whatever possibilities we have of redeeming ourselves, and the only way to God is through the welcome embrace of Jesus. And that's what this time of year is about. Now, we're heading towards Christmas. We'll get there soon enough when we celebrate the the actual incarnation, the actual greatness of this phenomenal fact that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to, to come as a human being into the world. But as we anticipate that, I think perhaps it would be good for us to think of what it is that, that Jesus is conveying in this parable about what Christmas represents. He had come as the one who is going to be the redeemer of the world. He, in fact, was the one who in, was going to go before us and to make possible this redemption, this welcoming back into the family, this forgiveness. We have our excuses. We have our justifications. You know, we have our words that we want to plead before him. But in fact, even before we can say those words, he wants to put his arms around us and to welcome us back into his family. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to look again at a, a parable that is very familiar to all of us, but perhaps to think of it in a new way. It's capturing something about not only your greatness and your love, but the loving behavior and the loving actions of your Son, Jesus Christ. And as we look forward to this time of celebration of the sending of your Son into the world as our Savior, Lord, we want to look to his teachings as an example that in some ways anticipates the very actions that he did in dying on the cross to redeem us. And so, Lord, as we think about your love for us and your sending of your son Jesus and then Jesus' willingness to put his arms around us, to embrace us and to offer a sacrifice on our behalf, Lord. We want to give you thanks for that. We want to thank you. We want to praise you for it. So we look forward in this coming season to again uh, commemorating your great love for us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.